So today, our chapel speaker is Pastor Jeff Harold. He is the founding pastor of New Beginnings Church in Ann Arbor. He's been there for 28 years. He and his wife, Monica, Monica's with us today. Would you mind just raising your hand and sitting right here up front? Glad to have you here. Uh, they've been married for 38 years. They have five kids, six grandkids, and three great-grandkids. I'm pretty sure like half of that's adopted because they don't look old enough to have, have that many kids and, and uh, that many great-grandkids. So we're glad to have him here with us today. Uh, in his free time, um, Pastor Jeff is a bivocational pastor, so he also works for the University of Michigan as the coordinator for academic standards and special populations for their College of Literature, Science, and Arts. And today he's going to be using our, our passage for the week, Hebrews 5, chapter, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 10, as the focus of his message. So as we get ready to worship, we'll pray for him um, between worship and the, the message. So as we get ready to worship, would you stand with me and just take a deep breath in through your nose, out through your mouth, maybe spread out a little bit. Um, and as we worship this morning, would you be intentional about recognizing that God is with us in this place? Uh, he invites you to pay attention to what he would like to share with you today. A message that by, might be a message of encouragement, of hope, a message that might be one of, of support and love, um, the message that might come directly through a song that we're going to sing or through Pastor Jeff's words as he shares from Scripture. But you can't hear that message unless you pay attention to what he is wanting to tell you. So would you take this minute, this second, and lay aside some of the things that you brought in the room and pay attention to what God may have for you this morning. Yeah, so now we're going to continue to worship by just inviting um, our speaker this morning, Pastor Jeff, forward. We're going to pray over him, so if you'd like to join in with that, please come forward. Yeah, Jesus, we just recognize in this moment that we were made for you. We were made for you, God, and, and without you, Jesus, there, we are left with a void and a hole deep within us, God, that only you can fill. Jesus, but you don't leave us in that spot. You are Emmanuel. You are God with us, Jesus. And if we're ever questioning what you think about us, Jesus, all we have to do is look back to the cross, Jesus, where you poured out everything for us, Jesus, just to be close to us, God. And that's who you are, God. You desire to be with us. And Jesus, I believe that you have something for us this morning, God. You are constantly looking to speak to us, Lord. And so right now, I pray over Pastor Jeff. And first of all, I thank you for his life. I thank you for his obedience, Jesus, and what has led us, what has led him to this point this morning, God, speaking to us. Jesus, I pray that you would open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears to receive what you're saying, God. And I pray that you give him an ability right now to speak the heart of God to us. Jesus, we thank you for him and we pray your Holy Spirit over him, God. Have your way in this space. In your name, amen.
Father, in the name of Jesus, for your graciousness and your goodness, we thank you and give you praise. As we look into your word, give us wisdom and understanding. Bless both the preacher and the hearer. If anything is left unclear after the preaching of your word, make it clear by the movement of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I'm going to ask if you would turn on your devices with me. I don't say turn on your Bibles anymore. Turn on your devices. Amen. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1 through 10. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1 through 10. We good? Okay. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, you are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. So when Brian Cono approached me at General Conference this past July in Orlando and asked me to be a fall chapel speaker, I told him it would be my pleasure. And then he called me again in August to follow up on the request, and I was glad to take his call. And then he told me the text was Hebrews 5, 1 through 10, which I just read, and I looked it up, and I said, oh, shoot. It is one of the few passages in Scripture where this unheard of guy named Melchizedek shows up. Now, I'm going to give you a newsflash. You're probably not going to hear your pastors preach very often on Melchizedek. Um, He first appears in Genesis chapter 14 when the patriarch um, Abraham has rescued his son Lot from some folks who have captured him. And it says he gave Melchizedek a tithe of all of the loot that he got from um, the war. And then he appears again in Psalms 110 when David speaks of the coming Messiah. And he says, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And then as I wrestled with this passage, I began to realize that the only reason he's talking about Melchizedek is to talk about why it is valid for Jesus to be a high priest. And so it's the book of Hebrews, right? And so he's writing to Hebrews. And if you know your Hebrew theology and and lineage, you realize that priests only came as descendants of Levi, and high priests were only descendants of Aaron. And so the first thing you have to settle is why Jesus could be a priest, period. And so the writer of Hebrews goes back and shows that even before the Aaronic priesthood, Melchizedek was a high priest chosen by God, and he puts Jesus in the order of Melchizedek. See, the reality is the focus of the passage is not Melchizedek. The focus of the passage is Jesus. And too often we focus on things and people and relationships when we should be focusing on Jesus. Now, let's get to the heart of the matter and the purpose of the high priest. The writer of Hebrews tells a few things about the high priest. First is the high priest is human. That he could relate to the people because he was one of them. And there's something about being among folks that understand who you are so that they can relate to you. 
He was designated as the go-between between God and us. And because he was one of the people, he was subject to the same weaknesses and temptations so that he could represent the people and gently deal with the people's shortcomings. Gently deal with their shortcomings. Because y'all know we got shortcomings, right? Now, I'm a father of five. I'm a grandfather of six. I'm a great-grandfather. And there are times when I'm upset with my kids. But when they have really messed up, not them. Because they know they messed up, right? And at that point, what they need is some gentle advice about how do I get out of this mess. And so a high priest had to gently deal with the misfortunes, miscomings of the people. And then he establishes the Jesus high priest who learned obedience um, to God through his own suffering. And even in the midst of his suffering on the cross, Jesus is interceding on behalf of the sins of others. And the risen Christ is still interceding for us today. So what does all this mean? Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we not without sin. Notice he didn't say sympathize. He said empathize. Because when I empathize with you, I feel your hurt. I mean, I physically feel your hurt. And I feel your pain. Now, I'm going to tell you, folks, I'm a crier. I could be doing a sermon and, and I could be thinking about what the people are going through. And it just brings tears to my eyes because... I feel the hurt. That's empathy. And it says that he is able to empathize with us. Now, I want to point out three things. I have a member in my church that says, Pastor, whenever you say three, you do four. Okay. I'm going to try to do three. Simple, simple points. First is that Jesus understands. He understands that we have a conflict between who we want to be and who we are. Like when we say we're going to be different today, and by 11.30 we know that's not going to happen. We're doing the same things we did because it seems like we just can't break out of this loop. He understands that when we find it hard to follow God's purpose in our life, because everybody else has a purpose for us. And you're really struggling to find out who you are and, and what you should be. And everybody is telling you who you should be. But Jesus understands. He understands that although people tell me I should not be tempted by the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life, I am. He understands. He understands where I am and what I'm dealing with. And as the old hymn goes, Jesus knows all about our struggles. And he gently deals with us when we sin and fail to do the things that we ought to do. Jesus understands. But Jesus also saves. The passage we read earlier said that the high priest has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as the sins of the people. But Jesus didn't have to offer sacrifices for his sins. But he did offer himself for us when he died on the cross. Hebrews 1, 3 says, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews 5, 8 says, Son though he was, he learned obedience From what he suffered and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Jesus saves our soul for eternity. Amen? Jesus also saves our reputation. Okay, I work at a college, people. I saw the drop deadline coming. Ours is November 8th. My main job where I work at in academic standards, I deal with students who are in trouble. 
I deal with probations and I deal with suspensions and helping students get back on track. I know what's behind a drop deadline. I know what's going on with relationships. I know what's going on with families. I know what's going on with mental health. I know what's going on with physical health. I know what's been going on with folks and I know how we feel and how things work out and how relationships happen between folks in school. And sometimes you need a restart because it seems like the person that you thought you were going to be has turned out to be somebody else. Folks, Jesus saves a reputation. Jesus saves a career. I came to school to be pre-med. I had this little problem. I didn't take biology. Biology took me. And God shifted me into another direction and has gave me a fantastic career in student academic affairs and ministry. Just when you think it's gone, Jesus saves a career. Jesus saves a degree. I'm going to tell y'all folks, Jesus saves a degree. When you think you're not going to make it out of here, sometimes you need to fall on your knees and say, help God. Help me get out of here so that that high priest can intercede. And I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes you need God to intercede with your professors. (laughs) You need help. Jesus saves our friendships. You ever been betrayed by a friend? I got a newsflash for you. Jesus was betrayed by his friends. I'm with you, me and you, thick, right, to the end. Next thing you know, they all gone. Sometimes you think folks are going to stick by you, and man, they done sold you out so quick. And that was a good relationship, but you know what? Jesus can fix the relationship. Because sometimes the one doing the selling out It's us. Jesus saves our future. You know, some people can't see past the day. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you, God has a future for you. You may think that there's nothing out there for you. You may think that the world has turned on. You may think, quite frankly, that there's no reason to go on. But God has a future for you. God has one. He knows the plans for us are plans to give us hope and a future. And the sins and misadventures of adolescents and young adulthood do not define who we will be forever. I am not my 20-year-old self. How much am I not my 20-year-old self? This is what I used to say to myself. I used to say, if the woman I was looking for would take me as I was, she would not be the woman I'm looking for because her standards are too low. (laughs) God saved me. God changed me. I would not be with this woman for 38 years if he had not because she knew what she was looking for. She wasn't taking the man I was. But I'm here to tell you, right, God has a future for you. God saves more than our soul. And finally, when we focus on Jesus, it allows us to see that our relationship with him does not depend solely on what he does for us, but on our obedience to him. This is about obedience, folks. This is about discipleship, and discipleship is learning to obey all that Jesus has commanded and doing it and adjusting our life and our worldview and our expectations to his plans. And his plans are not grievous. They are good for us. Sometimes we're in this fight with God. God, I want control. You ever heard that phrase, God is my co-pilot? That is an insult to God. God is not your co-pilot. He does not need you to steer. He does not need you to adjust. He does not need you to fly. He needs you to sit in the seat and let him take you where he wants you to go.
Now, I know you have to go to class. And I know some of you, right, are going to leave this chapel with that thing that you brought in here. Y'all know all of us got a thing. Y'all know that? I call it it. Our high priest intercedes for us when that it gets the best of us. But our high priest can also work with us so that it can leave us alone. And we can be all that God has wanted us to be. Jesus is here to help, and he lives to intercede on our behalf. And if he is willing to intercede for us in heaven, don't you think it stands to reason that he will intercede for us here on earth? Let me close with this passage, Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly, firmly, not weakly, folks, firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way. Tempted in every way. Just as we are, and yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. When we get past Melchizedek, we can focus on Jesus. Some of us are focusing on the wrong thing. We're looking around at all the things around us and we think that the actions or the behaviors are what we're supposed to do. If you focus on Jesus, Jesus will get the rest of the stuff right for you. And when we truly do that, we will see him as he is. And we will follow him and obey him. And our lives will never be the same. We pray with him. For your loving kindness and your tender mercies, God, we give you praise and we thank you. We bless you for who you are and all you do in our lives. Thank you for Jesus, our high priest, who ever lives to make intercession for us, Father. And we thank you for your word that tells us that you write, as John said, that we sin not. But if we do, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. Let us not carry our burdens and our fears and our faults and our failures, but help us to bring them to the cross, realizing that our great high priest ever lives to make intercession for us. Bless these students as they go to their classes, as they go back to their homes and apartments. I pray this will be the best semester that they ever had, not because they take biology, but because they take hold of you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.